All right, Cynthia. Yes. Cynthia, where are you from originally? New Jersey. What part? South. Like 30 minutes from Atlantic City. Mm-hmm. Tell me about your childhood growing up. Oof. Um, not good. Um, I am Mexican, so I feel, in my personal opinion, that the culture is very, very toxic. And it's mainly, like, focused on the man and, like, um, the women are attentive to them, and no matter what they do, it doesn't matter because there's food on the table, and you have a roof over your head, you have the nicest cars, you know, the newest cell phones, the nicest clothes. So whatever happens behind closed doors, just under the rug, pretend that, you know, life is good. So that's basically how my childhood was. This is your father that you're talking about? Well, yeah, my stepfather. Stepfather. Yes. I Well, he basically raised me since I was an infant. And the funny thing is that I didn't even know he was my stepfather until I was like 16. They just, I don't know why I kept that as a secret. And then the one day they sat me down they're like, okay, we're just going to let you know that, oh, he's not your real dad. But now, now that it matters because, you know, he's still your dad. And, and to me, it really didn't because um, I just believe in like nature versus nurture. And like, he basically did raise me. You know, he taught me everything that I know today and a lot of things that I still use today. So like- You mean nurture versus nature? Yes. So like- even though I'm not his biological kid, I feel like I'm his kid in that way because he just, he raised me. Yeah, he was your dad. Yeah, mm -hmm. my sister's dad. And how was childhood with, with that dynamic? Um, if you were to ask me that when I was little, I would say, oh, my childhood's perfect. You know, he's a great dad, he's a good guy. Everyone in town loves him. Um, he's charming. He is a good guy in the daylight, you know? He's your typical good guy. And at nighttime, I received all of his evilness. And basically, he started to molest me when I was six years old as early as I can remember. And it continued all the way up to I was 18, 18 years old. And you, you never said anything? I did. I said something when I was 16. And I had, like, a, you know, a girlfriend at the time, like, and I said something to her, and she spoke to... The guidance counselor, and then they made it a big thing, and you know, watched really so. They called the um, sheriff. I ended up going to the police barracks in town, and had to tell them everything. And I was there for seven hours, telling them everything will happen that that happened, and they arrested him. Like an hour of me talking to them, and then. Shortly after, I had to recant and tell the detectives, you know, child services, oh, it was all a lie. Like, I was, I'm crazy. I don't know why I said those things. He's a great guy. But it was all because it, I, was, I had to do it. Like, I was coerced to do it with my whole family. They're, the rest of the family did it? Yes. Every, it. every single family member was appalled that I, how could I do that to him? You know, he's a great guy. Like, Whatever happens, you know, at least, like, you still have a house, you know? So I had to recant, and it was probably one of the hardest, the very hardest moments of my life because my mother was very upset with me. So I had no support from anyone. No emotional support, no, I guess just morally. And no one was there for me. How does that make you feel as a little kid? 16 years old, right? Yeah, but it made me feel, I guess, 
what they made me feel my entire life, I started to believe, like, because they would always say, like, I'm crazy. Because I was the, I was very, like, um, hyper as a kid, like, very bad. Like, it just, so they were just like, oh, she's crazy. And then when my mental illness started to kick in, like, anxiety and, you know, depression, stuff like that, they're like, oh, see, she's crazy. You know, she's making all this up. So shortly after he got arrested, he was in jail for six months. And in those six months, I became very depressed because now my entire dynamic changed. Like my entire life was completely different. He was arrested for what? Um, I guess for rape, like Someone sexual else. abuse. Like they got him. And I thought that this was it for me. Like I was free. But when I started to recant, um, they believed me and let him go. And he came back to the house. I guess he was in jail for like six or seven months and he came back to jail. Like he came back home from jail. Just to be clear, the time he spent in jail was not your case or it was your case? No, it was my case. It was your case. Okay. He, yeah, he got arrested because I Yeah. Spoke but then out. You, oh, you recanted later? I recanted like the next few days because my family was in distraught. You think they would have let him free then? What do you mean, my family? No, the, the, he would have been... He wouldn't have gone to jail for six months if, if you recanted after a few days. Yeah, I don't know why the process was just too long. Like, we kept having to go to court, and I um, had to talk to the detectives, like, and the, his lawyers. Like, I made it all up. And I guess they believed that more than they believed my story. Because when I was at the police barracks giving my interview, I was there for, like, seven hours, and everyone believed me. Everyone was like this... We believe you, like, this story is crazy. Like, you have all the details. Like, we know you're not making this up. But I guess when I recanted, they believed that more, probably, because they just let him go. Well, I think there was a huge hole. When the victim is recanting, it just kind of puts a giant hole in, this, in the case. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hard to prosecute. Yes. Especially because all he had a lot of good statements from other people, like... He's a good guy. He he's not capable of this. Like there's no way. So. So what happened to you after that? When he came back, um, everything was different for a good three months. I was everything was peaceful, and when he came back, he, we sat down and spoke, just me and him. And he was just like, I'm a changed man. I'm a man of the Lord. I read the Bible in jail. I did all these like Bible studies in jail and I'm a changed man. Oh, I'm so sorry for what I did to you. And he was crying. So like I believed him. And in those moments, I was like, wow, like I have a dad now. Like I finally have a dad. Like all these years I had this monster and now I have a dad. So I believed him that the abuse was going to be over. And but then he like would sneak in little things in there by saying, oh, well, now things are gonna be different, so you're not gonna be able to go out as much. You know, I'm not gonna be able to provide things for you as much, but I feel like that was punishment. You know, him punishing me for letting out his secret. So it was a, a, a good three months that went by that nothing happened, everything was great. Like, no late night things and we ended up getting into a fight. And it was just a dumb fight about like my cat. And because of these few months of me feeling free and safe, I got like confident and we started to argue. And he was never aggressive. He's not an aggressive man, he's very calm. And he came up to me because I was talking back to him. And he stood in front of me and I was sitting down and he stood in front of me to intimidate me for talking back. And I stood up. And as soon as I stood up, he slapped me. And that was the first time he's ever laid hands on me. No pun intended. Like, and when he slapped me, I saw red and I felt everything that needed to come out since I was a little kid come out. And I just started punching him and just not, like I couldn't stop. I just kept wailing on him. And to this day, that's my greatest achievement. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. Like, and 
I just remember like the physical, like my knuckles hitting his face and it felt great. How, yeah, t tell me about the feeling of physically be beating up somebody who's been doing this to you for years. Oh my God, it was, I mean, at this point I was probably like 17 now. So like, I felt like, you know, badass teenager taking on my dad, like, but obviously he's very strong. So um, he stopped me, like he let, I think he let me. He let me get a few punches in because there's no way that he would just sit right. there or just stand there. He's probably a bigger so guy. I got a few punches in and my mom stepped in and my sister ran crying, hid in her room. And when my mom stepped in between us going like this, trying to stop the fight, I remember looking at him saying, watch, like watch what's going to happen now. Like I got you, like the ball's in my court now. And he just looked at me in fear. And I don't know what I meant by that, by saying watch. Like, I think I meant like, I'm gonna get you back now. Like I'm, but shortly after that, oh yeah, we didn't talk. I didn't talk to him for a few months after that. Like I felt like I took my freedom back and Ignored him, literally ignored him for months. He would try to talk to me, I would pretend he's not there. That's a good trait that my mother gave me to ignore and give you the silent treatment and make you feel like you're not in the room, which is a very toxic thing that I'm still learning to, you know, in therapy. But I started to feel bad that I was ignoring him and not talking to him and he would cry and he would just say, Oh, I just miss my girl. You know, I just miss my daughter. I don't I don't like that we're I don't like us fighting. I hated that we did, you know. And then one night he just came in my room as if nothing ever happened. And I just remember him taking my pants off. And then the guilt that I had of um avoiding him and ignoring him and hurting his feelings influenced my decision to just lay down and just not do anything. And that's the first time, or that's when now the rape continued again, when he came back from jail. Were you in some way cooperating with what he was doing? Um, no, at that point I was just in a dissociation state of mind where I would just lay there and just, um, because I didn't want him to be upset. And also because him being upset the next day, he would make me feel like I did something wrong. Like I remember plenty of nights when I was you know, younger where I would say no, like just leave me alone, like no. And he would respect that and he would just walk away. But then the next day, I was being punished. Like, if I needed new shoes, he'd be like, no. And this man has money, like he has a good job. And he would just say, no, like you don't deserve that. Or if I needed, or if I needed to go out or needed to do something or, hey, can you take me here? He would be like, no. I'm sure it's a complicated dynamic. Yeah, so then I was trained to just do as he says, because then I obviously learned that if I were to do what he said, then it would go good for me the next day. So I was able to sacrifice 10 to 20 minutes every night to have a good day the next day. So that was basically 13 years of that. Mm. All the time. And you got away at what age? Um, 19. I met someone and I told her everything that happened and she was appalled. And she's like, you're not living there anymore. And um, as soon as I told her everything, the next day she called her dad, her cousins, her siblings, and were like, we're getting Sin out of here. And they packed up his truck with my stuff, you know, from my, childhood bedroom, like a bed, dresser, and clothes, and took me out of the house and I never went back. And she basically saved me from 
the dysfunction continuing because who knows where I would be if that were to continue, you know, in my adult years. Because like I said, being in that culture, you don't talk about it. And no, even though people know, as long as you have a smile on my face, which I'm sure you can see that I've mastered, you can just continue to have a good life, you know, and act like nothing ever happened, no matter what's happening behind closed doors. Just don't talk about it. Just keep it in the closet. Yeah, just don't talk about it because if you talk about it, then it's an inconvenience and you're ruining the day, you're ruining the mood, and everyone's having a good day and you decided you want to talk about something that's detrimental to you and that's happening to you. Like, how could you? Like, how can you ruin my day for talking about something that happened to you? So I learned that very, very well. And I learned the smile technique. And I've learned that if you just smile, no one will ask you what's wrong. So then therefore you don't have to come up with a lie. You know, you don't have to be like, oh, well, I'm feeling this and I'm feeling that. And then you're forced to just A, open up. And then B, if someone has nothing to say to you, then you're just like, okay, well, I shouldn't have said anything. So if you just, Smile, then no one asks you any questions, and you know, you just keep it moving. And in hindsight, now, how old are you now? 29. You're 29, so you can look back at how everything went down. Would you have handled it differently now? Oh, yeah, yeah, I would have not recanted. I would have, um, even though that meant my whole family being upset with me, which it didn't do me any good because I still don't have any contact with them. Um, but I mean, given the circumstances that I was, you know, in, I don't blame my inner child for that, but if I could, I would not recant. I would take that back and just stay on my ground and let him rot in jail. Because from what I heard from the prosecutors when I was 16, that he was going to get, um, a lengthy service, like, uh, ser uh, ser he was going to serve a long time. S sentence. Yes, a long, long time. And I was good with that. I was happy with that. Even though that meant I was going to lose my dad, you know, the good part of him during the day, I was going to lose that. I was okay because then I was no longer going to experience what happened at night. So I was okay with that. But that's the only thing I would take back. You've been seeing a therapist? Yes. Yeah, she's amazing. She, um, in Pittsburgh, because I live in Pittsburgh right now. So I'm seeing a therapist. She is a trauma therapist and we do EMDR, which I'm sure you've heard of. Mm -hmm. And it's the That's best. A, this eye, eye movement? Yes, it's the best and worst tell, thing. Tell, tell, <laughs> tell the viewers who don't know what EMDR is. Um, what it is. Shameful, but I don't know what it stands for. I know it's like um, eye movement, realization, something. Mm -hmm. You basically either look at some a light moving back and forth or you listen to sounds on either ear back and forth, and it's supposed to stimulate bilaterally your brain and help you, you know, unlock memories and basically like bring your memories that are from the back that you have stored, bring them to the front and deal with them. Because from what I've gathered, a memory is supposed to feel like a memory. Not, it's not supposed to feel like it just happened yesterday. And if it just happened yesterday, then you need to work on it. And I want to say like 70% of my memories and my trauma feel like memories now because of my therapist. And she's great. And she props, you know, props to her for dealing with me. But she is probably one of the reasons why I'm still here because she's not giving up on me. And she's just like, you know, we got to get through this. Like, this isn't this isn't the end of the road for you. And so, yeah, I'm still doing that. And I'm pretty sure I'm probably going to do, you know, be in therapy for the rest of my life. How often would it go on with your dad? There's seven days in a week. Probably half, like three, three times a week, mm. you know. Um, more or less, depending on his mood, depending on... Anything. If he had a bad day, if he, had, if he had a good day, he would leave me alone. Um, and how are things now with him and your family? I don't have any contact with him whatsoever. My, he still lives at home. 
with my sibling and my mother. You were the only one that he would do this to? Apparently, and I've um, grilled my sister, and she swears up and down that it didn't happen to her. And I want to believe that. I want to believe that because it makes me feel good to know that she's his real daughter. But then again, when like um, common sense kicks in, so was I when I was an infant, all the way up to, you know, to he raised me. But he would also make comments about like, when I remember being little and asking him like, is my sister getting this too? And he would just say to me like, no, like it's just you. Like, you know, you're my special girl. And I believed it and I hope that it's true. So it was just me. How do you think this has impacted your adult life? Oh my God. Um, a lot <laughs> and it's going to for the rest of my life. And I have two step two stepkids now who are girls, and when I first met them, they were two and six. And as they, you know, grew throughout the years, I would just find myself comparing them to my childhood and looking at them and being like, "Wow, like they are never going to experience this pain." And it's such a beautiful thing to be a part of, to know that these two human beings are never going to hurt the way that I hurt. And they're never going to experience pain in the way that I did. Maybe, you know, obviously other ways, but like this way, I have the full, me, you know, and my partner have the full control of knowing that they are never gonna hurt like this. They're never gonna know what this is. And to me, that's like, that keeps me going to know that I can provide light, you know, for two innocent souls. And I mean, they're obviously one of the biggest reasons why I'm still here because I, it, it like gives me faith in humanity, you know, seeing two beautiful kids just grow and know like this darkness, they're never gonna know what it is. And your partner is a female? Yes. Do you think that's because of what you went through with your dad? That's funny that you say that because I just had a few therapy sessions like in the last couple of weeks about, you know, coming to the, to the realization like, is this why I'm with, I'm with a woman because of what happened to me? Because, you know, growing up- You would feel safer. Yeah, and growing up in my teen years, um, I was active with men and, you know, I am attracted to men. I, you know, I, you know, they're beautiful creatures just as much as females are but I don't feel, you know, safe with them. Like, not safe, just comfortable. And I just don't trust anyone. So I don't, I wouldn't put anything past anyone, especially males. So for me, it is more about like a, a safety thing to be with a woman, to know that they're not gonna hurt me in that way. And I just, I don't want to, I don't wanna try it with a man to see how it is just because I just, I'd rather not open that door. <laughs> it's understandable. But I mean, I find him attractive. Like I, you know, I can see a guy and be like, he's hot, <laughs> but that's it. Just keep it moving. Yeah, I mean, the right guy, maybe one day, but if you're happy now, you're happy now. I'm happy now. And I don't see that as an opportunity unless something were to happen, you know? God forbid something would happen because I am very happy with my wife. She is an amazing woman. And without her, I wouldn't not only physically be here, but like I wouldn't be right here. <laughs> and she encourages me every single day to just keep it moving and that my trauma does not define who I am. And it's not who I am. It's what I'm going to go through for the rest of my life, but it, it's not me. And it's not to say, you know, like with trauma victims, like when they boast about them being survivors, like, good. Like, I'm glad that that's how you feel. But to me, I don't want to look at it like, um, oh, something bad happened to me, poor me, and here I am now. If anything, like everything that I went through taught me 
a lot. And obviously like made me who I am today. So it's just a shitty road that I went on. And you know, I was fortunate to detour, to find my own road, to find my own peace and deal with the trauma. It seems, it seems like you're very able to speak about it calmly and that's because of my new therapist now. Yeah, well, I didn't have to give you a tissue. I didn't have to. No, because, you know, like I said, she validates me a lot. And, I mean, there's obviously moments where I go into therapy and I'm a wreck and I'm crying. And I, I feel and look like my dog just died. And that's just because I'm going to – that's how life is. I'm going to have days where I'm up and I'm good and then it's going to go back down. And then I'm depressed and I'm sad. And I feel guilt and I feel shame. And those are the, the two big things that I feel every single day is guilt and shame. And that's why I'm in therapy, because I don't want to feel those things. But I feel a lot of um, shame knowing that I was a teenager, you know, a woman. And I was allowing these things to happen to me. But I keep... Um, you know, just like replaying my therapist's words, like, you weren't allowing it. It's just it's all you knew. You know, that was your norm. That you're, was You were a kid. Yeah, like that. that's how you were. That's how your brain was trained, you know, because your crucial moments of your life when you're a kid, your brain is developing. Mine was developing to know that this is, this is normal. You know, this happens. And I remember, like, being a teen teenager and wondering, like, is this happening to my friends? Like, are my cousins going through this? Like, hmm, I wonder if that's happening with them. And like, because I thought it was just so normal. I thought I thought it was something that you do do just because of how he made it seem and he made it feel like, oh, I love you, you're my kid. Like, this is just another way to me showing you how I love you. And I mean, I believed it. I thought that that was love for a very long time. What advice would you give to somebody who, Latino or otherwise, that might be going oh, through something like this? Latinos. Um, it's hard with lat Latinos because they're stuck in their cultural ways. and But if it means that you are going to become the black sheep and you are looked at as the bad one and the crazy one, Just do it anyways. Because at the end of the day, at the end, at the end, there is that light at that tunnel. And it's gonna be a, a long, shitty tunnel. And it's gonna hurt and it's gonna suck. And people are gonna be upset with you and they're gonna call you names. They're gonna they're, and they're gonna blame you for ruining the family dynamic. But at the end of the day, like this is your life, you know? Like you have to live for you. You can't live for your mom or your grandma or your aunts or your uncles, like you have to live for you. And even though I have a shitty relationship with my mother who I don't, we talk every now and then because of my guilt, but she married him this year after everything, after all of this and decided to just marry him because she loves him and he's a good guy. And that's the biggest slap in the face to me. That was the biggest. Because one thing, you know, to turn your back on me and to not protect choose you. me, not, you know, not protect me, not be there for me. You know, yeah, it sucks, and, but I'm coping with it. You know, I was going to therapy. I was trying to find a middle ground with having a relationship with my mother and knowing that she did all these things to me as well. But now, her doing this, it just, like, like, I feel like my puzzle was almost complete. She just went like this to it. So I feel like now I'm back to square one, knowing that she was also abusive, like, to me. Like, realizing a lot of the things that she put me through when I was a kid was also abuse. But I never looked at it like that because he was the bad one. Like, he was the monster. So now I'm unpacking a whole new other. Yeah, but allowing you to allowing your partner to ha to do this to your kid. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
she's almost as guilty as he is. Or she probably is as guilty as he is. If not, she's a little bit more. Maybe. Just, you know? And that's what I'm processing now and realizing. And that's a whole another wave of emotions and feelings and depression and anxiety. And then knowing, like, if the two most important people that were supposed to love you and protect you hurt you, there's no way in hell that your partner's going to love you, you know? And that's where these are where all the abandonment issues come in and the trust issues and, you know, neglect to know mom and dad hurt you. My wife, my wife can't love me. There's no way. You know, my kids can't love me. There's no way in hell. But that's just, you know, the darkness and the trauma talking to you. And it's a battle every day. But I feel like today, now, that I'm going to survive this battle. And I think I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> I think so. I think so too. Cynthia, thank you so much for sharing your story. Of course. I wish you all the luck in the world. Thank you for having me. You are changing lives because you popped up on my um, YouTube page a few years ago. I was like, what is this man doing? You know, but you're doing a service to humanity. So thank you for having me. All right. Thanks, Cynthia.